Good morning. I'm glad you can take some time to devote to worship this day. I do have uh, two announcements before we get started. The first announcement is that this week on January 13th at 6 o'clock, we will have uh, the first board meeting of the year. And one of the topics we will be discussing is about a return to in-person worship. In as much as vaccinations have started, in as much as there are people who have recovered from this and have uh, some immunity built up from having uh, gone through this, uh, and in as much as we, we are practicing a very safe way of gathering, as safe as can happen with masks and distancing and uh, an upgraded HVAC system, I believe that by uh, the middle or to the later part of this month of January, January, we will be able to resume having worship in person. Uh, so we'll have details next Sunday after the board meets and we just think through and make sure we're approaching this in, in the way that makes the most sense for us here in Shelbina. Um, second announcement, uh, I continue to be very aware that the risk of this time for us as a church is that we, we begin to kind of fray. As I've been, uh, I was making some phone calls, catching up with people, and I can't keep track of everyone, but like I'll just listen to some folks and uh, sharing what, what's going on that I know. And, and I've come across a few uh, people that did not know who amongst us has uh, recovered, from, gone through and recovered from uh, COVID. And, and we're just, we're not, it's, it's getting hard to keep track of each other right now. And so I would ask you to continue to do what you can to keep us woven together as a church family. Uh, phone calls are probably the best bet. Phone calls, emails, whatever, just think through uh, who, who it is that you'd like to know how they're doing, and then call and find out. Ask how you're doing. So, um, so if those are the two announcements for today. It is an odd moment in the church year. We have celebrated the birth of Jesus. We have marked the arrival of the Magi, the wise men. And next week we move on to the baptism of Jesus and all that begins when Jesus begins to gather disciples and, and go and to teach and to heal and head through the, the, what we call the story of the Gospels. Right? But right now we are in this moment in between, which is weird. This is the moment in which Jesus is growing up, as all people do, fully human, right? He has to grow up. And we don't understand or know much about this, about this time in the life of Jesus. Now, the early church did. Though we know the early church did because it is attested multiple times in the New Testament that James, the brother of Jesus, was part of the leadership of the church at Jerusalem. And so he would have known the stories. Like he, he is, whatever his exact relationship was to Jesus, half-brother, cousin, I, I don't know. He would have been around and known the stories. But we don't know those stories. And it is not to say that they are somehow embarrassing. Like the, one of the most remarkable aspects of Scripture is how it pulls no punches. Like if you go through the Old Testament and the New Testament, like it does not pull any punches or sugarcoat anything. Right? It just tells the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Right? And so it's not that we don't have these stories because something is being covered up. I believe we don't have these stories because they don't line up with the goals of the, the stated goals of the authors of, of the gospel, right? If we look at Luke, Luke tells us at the beginning of the gospel of Luke that his task is to give an orderly narrative, an orderly telling of the story of Jesus so that you might believe. And as Luke put, the, this, put together the story of Jesus, he couldn't tell the whole story. He had to tell the, the amount of the story that would get you to be able to understand who Jesus is. And that didn't include the stories of his childhood. And it's the same thing with the other gospel authors. The gospel, uh, John, John's gospel. Like John is uh, creating this gospel that gives this cosmic sense of the word became flesh, right? This huge sense of, of Jesus in everything and how Jesus wor is working through everything and the stories of the childhood didn't fit into how John was approaching this 
And, and Mark, like Mark is telling when uh, if you read the Gospel of Mark, he is telling the fastest version as quickly as possible. One of the most common words in the Gospel, according to Mark, is immediately, 42 times. Like he is just immediately, he is going somewhere, right? He just he doesn't have time to stop and tell us about Jesus' childhood. He barely has time to tell us that Jesus was born, right? The Gospel, in, the infancy narratives we have come from Matthew and Luke because they, they take the time to tell us about that. Right? And that brings us to Matthew. Like, the gospel according to Matthew, Matthew takes the time to make sure we understand uh, Jesus' genealogy, how he is deeply rooted in uh, being the, a descendant of Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. And, and Matthew is really taking the time to make sure we understand Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish prophecies given by the prophets, the, the Jewish Messiah. Right? And so each of the four uh, authors of the four Gospels, they're telling the story of the same person, but each of them has a slant to it. Each of them is writing for a different uh, community, needing to do a different thing, and none of them need to say much, anything, about the time in which Jesus is growing up, with one exception. And that's what we turn to today. Today we turn to the one moment when we get a little bit of a glimpse of what it was like, what Jesus was like growing up. We read here, it's in Luke chapter 2, Verses 41 to 52. Every year, Jesus' parents traveled to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up as they always did. And when it was over and they left for home, the child Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know. Thinking he was somewhere in the company of pilgrims, they journeyed for a whole day and then began looking for him among the relatives and neighbors. When they didn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to begin looking for him. The next day they found him in the temple, seated amongst the teachers, listening to them, asking questions. The teachers were all taken with him, impressed with the sharpness of his answers. His parents, however, were not impressed. They were upset and hurt. His mother said, young man, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been half out of our minds looking for you. Jesus said, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I had to be here dealing with the things of my father? But they had no idea what he was, what he was talking about. They did not understand. So Jesus went back to Nazareth with, Nazareth with them, lived obediently with them. His mother held these things dearly, pondering them within herself. And Jesus matured, growing up in both body and spirit, blessed by both God and people. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. To understand what is happening here, first, it is important to realize that a 12-year-old, as we conceive of it today, is not the same thing as a 12-year-old in the first century. In agricultural-based societies, a 12-year-old was about to be an adult. The Jewish culture, it, it had not happened yet in Jesus' day, but in the not too distant future would develop what's called the bar mitzvah, which is, you probably have heard the term, it's the moment at which a child becomes an adult because they are responsible for their actions. And, and you get to your bar mitzvah at age 13. And so a 12-year-old is a, someone who is on the cusp of being an adult. The modern, our modern idea of a teenager <coughs> doesn't develop, doesn't occur until the 1910s and 20s with the invention of high school, which was a way to keep uh, people, people that young out of the factories because it was uh, considered a bad thing to have 14-year-olds uh, in the factories. Um, th a 13, 14-year-old in the field is a good thing. In a factory, not so much. And so the comparison I think we should make today is not of a 12-year-old Jesus to a 12-year-old as, as we know 12-year-olds. I think the comparison would be to like a 17-year-old 
who has his or her license, who is driving, has a job, is on the cusp of adulthood, who is almost there. And so the comparison would be that Mary and Joseph, are they're not traveling with a young child who gets lost. They're traveling with someone who is an almost grown adult with whom they are entrusting more and more responsibility in the same way that a 17-year-old, you'd say, okay, now you can drive in town, or now you can drive one town over. You're just sort of letting them stretch their wings a little bit further, one step at a time. And so it's easy to imagine in that situation. They leave for home. They, they've told Jesus when they're going to leave for home and they're going to go back and they're sort of caravanning and, and they look around at the end of the night because Jesus has been uh, out and about because that's what they'd assumed he was up to, being now on the cusp of, adult, of adulthood and being trusted to be able to take care of himself for the most part. And they look around and he's not there. And I'm sure that was not an enjoyable moment for Mary and Joseph. And so they have to go back to Jerusalem to find him. I'm sure Mary is probably checking every ditch on the way back, too, making not dead in a ditch somewhere. <laughs> so we got to wonder, like, did Jesus forget to tell them what his plan was? Did he choose not to tell them? Is the comparison more apt? Is it like he's a teen who accidentally forgot about his curfew? Or was this a deliberate choice? When Mary and Joseph find him, we read that Jesus was listening and asking questions of the teachers in the temple, some of the most learned people in all of the land. What was he listening for? Was he asking the questions or were the teachers? And if he was asking the questions, was he asking so that he could learn or so that they could learn? When his parents find him and they ask, what on God's green earth are you doing? Which I admit is, I enjoy using that phrase with regards to, to Jesus, right? But what on God's green earth were you thinking? And he responds, with surprise. Didn't you know that I would be doing this? Like, is Jesus genuinely surprised that they were surprised? What's going on here? And then we read that Mary and Joseph did not understand. And if, when it comes to raising children, I can think of no other words that are more true or more accurate. They did not understand. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you, Mary. I, I hear you, Joseph. And this story wraps up with two comments. The first is we read that Jesus continued to grow in wisdom and maturity and the grace of God and the people. And it is, brings us back to, like, what does it mean for Jesus to grow up? What does it mean for him to grow in wisdom when he's fully divine? How does that work? Like just thinking through childhood, like I remember um, a nurse when we, were, we had a Sophia, a nurse told me that to a newborn infant for a good long while, if you're not in the line of sight of that baby, you don't exist. I, that's what they, your, their reality is what they can see in front of them. And so if you're over there, you don't exist because you're not in their line of sight. And, and that was a very good thing to know. Right? And, and so was that the case with Jesus? How, how would that have worked? How much did Jesus have to learn the hard way? Like, I can show you scars right there and right there. Like, I can show you the scars from learning to use a knife. Is that how Jesus learned to use a hammer, working with his dad? And when Jesus built his first chair, was it true? Did it sit stable? Or did it wobble like you would expect a first chair to, to do? Right? It, and if it was like a perfect chair, was Jesus surprised by this? And did he show his friends? And did his friends think he was odd? Was Jesus an odd child? We can keep asking questions like this for a long time, and we just don't know the answers. We won't know the answers, not in this lifetime. Some of them we might never know. 
And so we have to, first, the first comment that Jesus continues to grow in wisdom and maturity leaves us with a lot of questions. The second comment that this story ends with is that Mary ponders. She takes all that has happened and she ponders it in her heart. She ponders in her innermost part of her being. Like she really dwells on this. She ponders because she is confused. She doesn't know. She's not certain. And if you read through this with an eye towards Mary, you notice that Mary ponders a lot. When Mary is told that she's going to have a child, she then ponders, like, what is happening? She doesn't understand. She's excited. This is good, but she doesn't, doesn't get it. She meets up with Elizabeth, and they're excited together, but they both have time to ponder and be confused. She has this child, and a bunch of shepherds show up. And if I was Joseph, that would not be what I would want to have happen. Oh, people knocking on my door. My, my wife has just had a child, and I don't know you. Should I let you in? Like, Mary and Joseph are very gracious. They let the wise men in down the road, and let, they let the shepherds in here, right? And so the shepherds come in, and they share all this amazing news, and they leave. And then Mary, we read, she ponders. She wonders. She's not sure, but she's going to think on it. Right, and here it is in this moment when Jesus has done something that is very hard to understand, and we read that she ponders. She kept all of these things in her heart. It is a good thing for us to notice how much Mary ponders and wonders and questions and, and just isn't sure, because she is the first person to say yes to Jesus. She is Jesus' first disciple. She said yes, right? She said yes. She accepted Jesus into her life, even, not even knowing what that's going to entail. And the way that she learns is she spends time with him. She's really sure of what's, of what's happening, but she, the only way she's going to find the answers to these ponderings is to spend time with Jesus. And so what Mary learns about Jesus, she learns the slow way, the way of doing, right? She doesn't sit back and wait, right? She has to raise her child, and she learns along the way as she raises this child, which does take a while. If you have raised your children, think about how long it takes to figure out your children, assuming you ever figure out your children. Right? The way that Mary learns is by being with Jesus, by paying attention, and by being patient. And as the first disciple, Mary is an excellent model for us, an excellent example for the church. How does the church learn who Jesus is? We do it the same way Mary did. It takes some time. It takes paying attention to Jesus, and not just paying attention, because the way we learn is we learn in the doing. Right? Jesus asks his disciples, follow me. Do what I do, right? Follow me. Jesus doesn't say, think about me, or wait, and it will come to you, right? The way that Mary learned about Jesus was in the doing, that's in the raising of him. And the way that we learn of Jesus is in the following, in the doing what Jesus did. It is a patience, knowing that we only understand over time, but it is a very active patience. I got to keep on following if I want to understand. And the following involves doing what Jesus did. We wait as people who don't have certainty. We wait as people who have many questions. I can just pages and pages of questions. I, there are always questions. But we understand enough. We understand enough to follow Mary's example and to patiently, actively, be involved with Jesus. For Mary, it was raising him, and for us, it is following him. It is enough to be able to follow and trust that over time, we will learn and understand more, that we will learn what can only be learned in the doing, in the practice. 
So that as we follow Jesus after his baptism, that we know that the only way to understand more about who he is, is to get to it. To go and do what he did under his guidance, understanding that, no, that to understand Jesus does not happen in the abstract. Abstract data about Jesus is not worth a lick. It is the following of Jesus, the experience of forgiveness and service and study and prayer with other disciples as the church together. That is how we learn. That's how we know. This forms not just how we live, it also informs how we invite. I follow Jesus. That is my life's work. I don't understand everything about him, but I understand enough to get started. And I can invite other people to join me in doing so, and I invite you to join me in doing so if you are not doing so already. Please, join me. And if you have questions, like this is where I, I sense a hesitation when I, when I also, I'll, we put, up, put together an event and I'll say, invite your friends, invite your neighbors, and, and, and there's, people get concerned. I, I sense this deep concern, like, what if someone asks a question and I don't know the answer? That's okay. Like, we don't have all the answers. What we have is a way of life, following Jesus, and in the following, we will learn, right? I invite you to follow Jesus with me. And in the following, we will learn the answers to the questions, and we will learn it in the way that Mary did, in the doing, and actively paying attention. My invitation is to be like Mary. Pay attention to Jesus. Follow him and we figure it out as we go. Figuring out with the confidence that who we follow loves us. Loves us so much that he will die for us. And rise from that death to lead us into the kingdom that is to come. We don't understand everything about the journey that we are under, that we have undertaken. That's okay. The journey is good. We'll learn as we go. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for sending Mary. Thank you for the mother that she was and how she shows us how to ponder, how to do so patiently. We pray for the grace to be able to join her in doing the same. Further, we pray that in doing so, that we might grow in our own understanding. We pray for the people of this nation, that we might find the way forward that embraces peace, seeks a common good. Further, we pray for opportunities to embody that peace in how we love our neighbor that we might be ambassadors of reconciliation. Lord, in the end, we know that our hope is in your kingdom and in being your people, and that your people are a people of peace. Help us to live that peace, to remember that your kingdom is not established through violence. Your kingdom is established through a cross by rejecting violence and embracing resurrection. We pray that that hope might sustain us the rest of our lives as we follow you. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day and always. Amen.